Hey, Mushroom Nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I'm spending a little bit of time out in the woods and I wanted to share with you some tips for spotting black trumpet mushrooms and a few other cool fall mushrooms that we have that are edible or delightful or interesting. But I am pointing at the ground directly at some black trumpet mushrooms. Black trumpets are really delicious. If you look closely, you can see they're just these little, uh, you know, sort of tubular fruiting bodies here. There's another one right here. I am at the base of a giant beech tree, and that is often where I find a lot of these uh, black trumpet mushrooms. And uh, in the eastern U.S., the species um, is Craterellus phallax. And I say eastern United States because in the west they have a different species of uh, black trumpet mushroom, but they share a lot of the same characteristics and also uh, the same sort of earthy, almost fruity flavors. Uh, but I love Craterellus phallax because it has some really interesting coloration and it is, I mean, you know, ridiculously difficult to uh, spot. And so it's really uh, very exciting to find them. So I'm gonna point down here uh, yet again at the spot where they are. So there's a few of them right here. And if you start to, um, basically my recommendation is if you see one, hit the deck and just take your time and look around because uh, you know, these mushrooms look so similar to fallen leaf litter. It's very difficult to spot them. And so it's almost one of those, like you get the gestalt uh, in your mind of what a mushroom looks like and it's sort of dialed in and you'll catch it out of the corner of your eye. And that's how it often happens for me. And then I'm like, okay, there's at least one here. And oftentimes Craterellus phallax grows in uh, a lot of fruiting bodies. So once you see one, sit down and, uh, you know, take a minute and look around. So as far as identification, this is a really pretty easy mushroom to identify. You have fairly diminutive fruiting bodies and they're also fairly thin. Uh, and when they're dried out, they're not like papery, but you know, you certainly don't have a lot of flesh here. Uh, and Craterellus phallax, when you, um, you know, open it up all the way, you'll see that it is just basically a tube all the way down the middle. And also it has um, oftentimes, you know, like a, a rib or a ridge of very blackish coloration. And sometimes the inner portion here is quite black, but as the mushroom matures, you know, you'll oftentimes see them more of this sort of blackish gray color and almost with a little bit of furriness. And that's on the inside. And then on the outside of Craterellus phallax, you have a uh, sort of a smooth surface, a little bit wrinkly, and it's a gray color sort of variegating to this almost peachy color. And that's uh, the peachy pink color of the spores. So this is a, a specimen that sort of demonstrates all of those features that you'll see, but they come up in, um, you know, this just these explosions of really cool little tube fruiting bodies. Uh, and Craterellus in general is a genus of mushrooms that is in some respects similar to uh, Cantharellus or the chanterelle mushrooms. But uh, as far as, you know, being desirable, some of them have fruity flavors and aromas. Some of them are, have sort of wrinkly false gills underneath but craterellus in general i kind of like separate them apart by craterellus tends to be more cratered and uh you know tubular and hollow than a lot of your uh cantharellus mushrooms of course exceptions all that fun stuff so this is just sort of back of the napkin math to get me in the direction of the genus so again these are really difficult to spot but they do uh form you know, quite large colonies. And another thing to note about uh, black trumpets is that they do come back in the same place, but they don't come back in the same place every year. So for instance, I visit this tree and I get black trumpets here once probably every other year. And sometimes I don't see, you know, hardly any the whole year long, but this is the beginning of October. We had a really nice uh, tropical storm as far as dropping a lot of water on us. So um, I just picked up, I'm, I'm gonna brag just for a moment because I don't usually do this, but I have a lot of black trumpets and I'm very pleased with myself. Um, so, you know, I'm going to spend the afternoon um, cleaning them up and then I'm going to dehydrate them. And the best thing to do with black trumpets is to dehydrate them and that intensifies their flavor. And then you rehydrate them and you use that water that's kind of a blackish water that is, has the same sort of pungent and pleasant aroma and flavor as black trumpets. And then you use that as, uh, you know, a base for something like a cream sauce or a stock. And then you use also the mushrooms. But as you can tell, 
you know, the, I've collected a whole bunch of them, but they don't have a tremendous amount of substance. So really the thing that's interesting about Craterellus phallax is you lose, um, you know, they're, they're not so uh, moist that you lose a ton of uh, sort of overall weight when you dry them out. But that flavor intensification process is really uh, remarkable and makes the whole thing great. I also really like the consistency and texture of black trumpets. So once they are cooked, they have this sort of like almost um, like the uh, mushrooms that you'll find in sweet and sour soup, which is uh, the wood ear mushroom is uh, sort of like a, a little bit crunchy, a little bit rubbery, but rubbery good. So anyway, that's the black trumpet scene in the eastern U.S. We see them throughout the fall, but they can be kind of persnickety. And, um, <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned, they really favor uh, oak and I find them primarily under beech trees. And that may just be because oak leaves and black trumpets look identical and beech litter and black trumpets don't look quite as identical because as you can see, beech is a little bit lighter colored than uh, some of your oak stuff. Okay, so we've talked about black trumpets. Let's talk about some other cool things. Uh, so I have a couple gorgeous specimens of uh, the Caesar mushroom or the Eastern Caesar mushroom. This is Amanita jacksonii. And uh, some people say jacksoni. I say jacksonii because I don't speak Latin and a double I comes out as a double I. So uh, I'm stuck with it and you're stuck with it too. Um, but anyway, this is a beautiful mushroom that is edible and uh, part of a section <clears throat> of the Amanita genus called uh, the Caesariae. And so these are mushrooms sort of generically called Caesar mushrooms, and there's a lot of them all over the world. But uh, the slender Caesar mushroom uh, that we find Amanita jacksonii in the eastern United States has a couple of really beautiful uh, distinguishing characteristics. So first of all, you'll see this is a classic cap and stem mushroom that it has a really um, bright white sort of goose egg like cup of tissue at the base. And that is um, a little soft, a little bit almost leathery like it, it has some consistency to it. And then the mushroom itself is this very cheerful sort of yellow color, including yellow, uh, orangey gills, and then the, this wonderful partial veil. So that's basically a veil of tissue protecting the mushroom's gills. And as it breaks, you'll see it leaves this like really <clears throat> festive flamenco like skirt on uh, the stem. So those are really good characteristics to look out for. Uh, and then you also have a reddish cap and oftentimes you have, you know, darker red and sort of getting more in the orangey yellows around the outside. I'll show you some older specimens that have slightly, um, you know, variegate the, the variation in their colors will become evident. Uh, and then you also have striation. So it's just this very distinctive, uh, like stripiness that you'll see along the margin of the cap. And a lot of mushrooms have this, but Amanita jack Sony eye, it, it ascends up the margin of the cap pretty substantially. The thing that makes Amanita jacksonii kind of hard to um, tell apart from a lot of our other Caesar mushrooms is it tends to have, and this is not unique, but pretty unique to this species, this um, orangey ornamentation on the stem. It looks like stretch marks or almost snake skin sometimes, leaves little uh, sort of pointy chevrons. And so we have a lot of other sort of Caesar type mushrooms, but they don't have those features or some of them are orange or yellow. Um, here's another one. You can see the striation really substantially there with a nice little red uh, umbo or nipple right in the middle. And then again, this uh, very distinctive cup of tissue at the base. Uh, these mushrooms are edible. I um, only consume them when they're like in their egg form. So when they're much, much younger. Uh, however, they're just gorgeous to feast your eyes upon because they can be so large. And as they, you know, get mature, the edges of them can crack. And there's also a lot of um, really interesting scientific stuff and research in the section Amanita, uh, like the Caesar section, because we have a lot of them and a lot of species that are very colorful, but kind of cryptic in the United States. So that's something that I always love to, um, you know, pay attention to. But this pat uh, particular specimen, I think the thing that really gets me about it is the quality and completeness of this ring on the stem. Because a lot of your mushrooms that have rings on the stems, they become damaged and become, uh, you know, way more chaotic very quickly. As you can see, this one's chaotic for a variety of reasons. Another mushroom I wanted to show you that similarly I'm like obsessed 
with the ring on the stem is this particular uh, blusher mushroom. So uh, the best I can do scientifically is to call this generically Amanita amira rubescens species group. And like there's a lot of different uh, blushing mushrooms in the United States that are in the Amanita genus. They have a little bulb at the base. Uh, a lot of them are warty on top and you have sort of yellowy warts with also, you can see little streaks of blushing and reddish reactions. You can also see it here at the base and a lot of uh, sort of like little reddish blushing situation. But the thing I love about blushers is when their um, partial veil rings are intact, they're just gorgeous because you oftentimes have this like little, it's almost like it's doing some sort of uh, fancy flourish with its uh, skirt here. And then, uh, you know, almost this like dark little uh, rim right at the very bottom of it. And I don't see that very frequently, so I just had to pick this one up uh, to show you. All right, so let's move on to another edible mushroom. Uh, let's talk about honey mushrooms. That's right, I was gonna do that. So we have two different ki kinds of honey mushrooms. They're very abundant, or at least, well, I mean, there are more, but I have two different kinds of honey mushrooms with me right now that are very common and easy to find. So this one is sort of the, your classic honey mushroom. Uh, Armillaria malia is the species name, and I'll talk about its distinguishing characteristics in a second. And then we also have a very abundant ringless honey mushroom um, that is scientifically called uh, Desar malaria cespitosa. And these mushrooms, these are uh, like at the age that I typically would collect them to eat. They can get really big and really gnarly. And so, um, you know, I'm going to show you these mushrooms because these are the ringless honeys that I, um, you know, if you're going to eat them, they're a lot less likely to be unpleasant and gnarly for you. Uh, all right, so let's begin with the honey mushroom, Armillaria malia. So I have a couple of them right here. This is a highly parasitic species. They get called honey mushrooms because they have this beautiful sort of uh, golden brown color very often, not always, but that is like why they have that common name. And they grow, um, you know, in these little uh, bouquets and clusters and you'll grow, see them growing on wood, but you'll also see them growing on the ground beneath distressed or dead trees that the uh, fungus is basically choking to death. And so, uh, you know, you'll see these very robust uh, sort of colonies of them coming up. And besides this sort of, uh, you know, yellowy cap, and you often have like a little bit of scurfiness on the top here, uh, underneath you'll see that they also have a partial veil. It's really, in the case of the honey mushroom, kind of thick. So it's like this little protective uh, layer here, and that leaves those distinctive rings on the stem. But often, like when they're younger, they almost look, as you can see, you know, those partial veils are still almost all attached. And as they come off, the mushrooms fall onto the ground, but you'll see the uh, partial veil pop open and the gills underneath are exposed. So um, the consistency of honey mushroom is also pretty interesting. Uh, they are much more like snappy and uh, firm than many other mushrooms are. So that makes them good and like crunchy if you're into crunchy type things. Um, and another feature that these mature ones have that's very distinctive, um, and you don't see this all the time, but when you do, it's quite pretty, is this sort of um, furry patterning and uh, sort of like this outer, um, surface of the mushroom that's almost furry that it breaks apart and leaves uh, some sort of material on uh, the stem. And as you can see, the gills are sort of white and attached to the stem. And again, these mushrooms are pretty hardy and they do grow in those very substantial clusters. Um, and ringless honey mushrooms, by way of contrast, don't normally look uh, honey-like at all as far as their color. They're more of a tan, brownish color. Uh, sometimes I see them, you know, when they're older, they get much, much more dark as they start to rot. So you'll see like these dark brown piles of mushrooms everywhere. And that is Desarmillaria cespitosa. And uh, this mushroom is a menace to the hardwood trees in my yard. I've lost a willow tree and a couple of poplar trees to it. So it's very, um, you know, very parasitic, but there's not much you can do about it. Uh, but if you're into observing fungi, at least there's, you know, that to be said for it, and you can also eat them. So uh, like the honey mushrooms I was just showing you, they gr grow in these little clusters. 
uh, but they don't have rings on the stem. Also, you'll notice that they um, have the same sort of like tough and, uh, you know, a bit resilient consistency compared to a lot of other mushrooms that they're, um, you know, the, the regular uh, honey mushrooms have. And uh, then on the, the cap, again, they're sort of a brownish color, but they also are a little bit scurfy and furry. And sometimes you'll have these really distinctive blackish little wiry hairs on the very top. But that tends to happen as the mushrooms get a little bit older. But they can be quite pleasant to eat. Um, you know, honey mushrooms don't agree with everybody, so it's important to prepare them well and just um, be mindful that not everybody is a big fan. So um, let's talk about one more and then I'll show you a couple of uh, uh, coral mushrooms and then I'll be done. <laughs> All right, so this is a really fun mushroom to find. Um, the Amethyst Lacaria or Lacaria ochropurpurea is the uh, scientific name. And that honestly is probably the least confusing because there's a West Coast species that is also sort of purpley colored um, that is Lacaria amethystina. So anyway, this is a mushroom that looks rather drab from the top. It's sort of a grayish color. You can see sometimes a little bit of purple tones, but when you flip it over, it has these like cartoonish mulberry purple. I mean, they're just preposterous gills and they're very, very deep and uh, chunky. And so like a lot of mushrooms, their gills are you know, here, let's look at our, our Caesar here. The gills are very, uh, you know, thin, blade-like and delicate, but also not super deep. In the case of Lacaria uh, ochropoporia and other Lacaria mushrooms, this is a good tell for them, is that they have these like really deep, crunchy gills. Um, and then in addition to that, let's see, let's look at the stem. The stem is similarly sort of, um, you know, not a terribly distinctive color. You get a little bit more of the purple often, but it's almost like a little flossy whitish. Uh, so they tend to be kind of soft. And a lot of the younger ones almost have these sort of adorable chest piece type of heads. But again, when you look underneath, you just have these really ridiculous um, and beautiful purple gills. So that's an edible, edible mushroom as well. I think one other thing I'll note is um, sometimes you'll see uh, like little bits of um, like spider web or something similar on uh, the gills of these mushrooms. It's just a really common occurrence and nothing to be alarmed about. Uh, but I, I love the fact that they're just so sort of plain looking from the top. And, uh, you know, oftentimes they're sort of just rounded, but not anything spectacular. And then when you, uh, you flip the carrier over, it's just this, this smoke show. It's very, very fun. All right. I think I'm done for now. I was going to talk about Romeria, but I just simply don't have energy for it. The long and short is there are a lot of coral mushrooms and they're beautiful. Here's Romeria stricta. It's nice and skinny and tall. Here is not Romeria stricta and he's chonky and short and a little bit pink. I have another one that's pink. Um, so what I'm getting at is that Romeria is a fleshy terrestrial genus of mushrooms. A lot of them are edible. They're very beautiful and I can't tell them apart, nor am I going to take the time to try to um, convince you that I have anything worthwhile to say about them, except that they're cool. Anyway, I hope y'all are doing great. The fall mushroom season is uh, fully here, but we have a few cicadas out still. We have a few chanterelles still out, so um, keep on getting out in the woods, enjoy yourself, and we'll talk again soon.